Right. Um, great stuff all. So um, maybe because we've got a lot to get through today, we can um, kick off today's session. Um, first of all, uh, welcome to today's LexisNexis first innovation panel, um, or our first interactive workshop. Um, I'm Alex Wakelin. I'm the product manager for customer experience for LexisNexis. Um, before I hand it over to today's moderator, Sophie, um, and our panelists, um, a couple of housekeeping matters, uh, as you've observed, you've all been set up as muted, um, uh, but you can contribute and we, we would really, really like you to do so um, via either the chat function or the Q&A function. Um, both Q&A and chat will be monitored and any matters raised will be directed to the panelists during the session. Um, if you want to be anonymous, you can use the Q&A function, but we're all friends here, so please don't feel you have to. Um, uh, for your information, today's event will be recorded um, and there'll also be notes taken about the discussions um, which will be distributed to everyone after the event. Um, there'll be a pop-up survey um, that we are very keen for you to fill out just to give us a feel for how the, today's session went. Um, do let us know how we how it all you enjoyed it and um, or didn't um, and ensure that we can make this valuable on an ongoing basis. Um, and now let me hand over to Sophie Marsh, who's head of our um, product and customer discovery. Uh, Sophie has been with the LexisNexis business for a number of years, both in New Zealand and the UK, um, and has been a driving force behind the establishment of this LexisNexis innovation panel um, and the New Zealand discovery strategy, focusing on ensuring our customers are the focus of our content and product development. Um, Sophie is moderating today's event. So Sophie, over to you. Thanks, Alex. Well, tēnā koutou katoa, no mai hare mai, and welcome to this, the inaugural LexisNexis Innovation Panel Virtual Workshop, uh, centering on the future of law in Aotearoa. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, as Alex mentioned, my name is Sophie Marsh, and I'm the Head of Product and Customer Discovery here at LexisNexis. Um, so the LexisNexis Innovation mentioned by Alex was launched this year with the intention of collaborating uh, on legal technology innovation with New Zealand legal professionals. Um, and today is the first in a series of quarterly group innovation workshops. So future group workshops will be uh, interactive, focusing on technology themes and upcoming LexisNexis features and developments. Um, we'll also be inviting our innovation panel members to participate in ongoing user research activities that are relevant to them as and when these arrive. So um, I'll be speaking more about how you can join up to the panel if you haven't already done so at the end of today's session. So stay tuned. Um, so looking at today's agenda, we have a jam packed agenda for today. Um, during the course of this lunchtime court at all, we'll be exploring how the pandemic has impacted on legal technology. Um, we'll be looking at what technologies will disrupt the legal industry most in the short and mid term. Um, and we'll also be looking at the impact that technology has on the human element of legal practice. We'll be posing questions to the audience by interactive polls throughout the session, and there'll also be a Q&A at the end. So we invite you to send through any questions or comments, as Alex mentioned, using either the Q&A function or the comments function. Um, and we'll endeavour to get to as many questions as possible. So we are delighted to have with us today a panel of experts from academia and legal practice who are all at the centre of the conversation about legal technology in Aotearoa. Um, so you can see them all up on your screen now, Anchali and Anaya Gum, <laughs> sorry Anchali, I think I did put you there, um, is an expert in all the legal aspects of technology, media and telecommunications. Over the last 15 years, Anchali has advised public and private customers and their suppliers alike on tech, media and telecommunications products and services. She's a member of the AI Forum Working Group on AI Awareness, advises on tech adoption and innovation and works with local and international content producers and suppliers to the media sector. We're so happy to have you here today, Anjali. Um, Tom Marsland leads Minter Ellison Redwatt's technology, media and telecommunications practice. He advises on emerging technology areas such as cyber, cyber security, artificial intelligence and blockchain related advice. He's an author and regular speaker on transformative transformational and strategic technology issues and developments and leads the Minta Ellis and Brad Watts relationships with their joint venture partner McCarthy Finch, the developers of Orthodox AI product. Welcome, Tom. Hi. <clears throat> um, and Wayne Rumbles is the project leader on the Technology and Legal Education for New Zealand project, which is funded by the New Zealand Law Foundation. 
Um, this collaborative project is designed to integrate technology focused legal education across the national core curriculum of the LLB to prepare, prepare graduates for their future digitized workplace. In addition to this work, Wayne teaches and researches in the areas of cyber law, law and new technologies, criminal law with a focus on cyber crime, and teaches New Zealand's first masters in cyber security. So welcome, Wayne. Yep. Hi. Fantastic, as I say, to have all of you with us today, and we're really looking forward to the discussion. Um, so to kick things off, we're actually going to start with a poll um, for our audience that you should be seeing on your screen now. So we're keen to hear what the biggest technical technological challenges that you faced in your legal practice or study during lockdown were. So feel free to submit your answers and um, be interested to see the things that come through from that. We'll just give you a couple of minutes to answer that. Um, some, You've got some themes coming through there, Alex. Yeah, yeah. It's looking at the moment, like collaborating with colleagues is a big, um, big challenge. Uh, sourcing online versions of, of inaccessible hard copy resource um, is probably the second largest challenge um, that people have encountered. And certainly, those are things that um, that we're still coming through during that during the, the lockdown and beyond. Um, they can hopefully. Um, See there, so collaborating with colleagues effectively, as Alex says, is coming in at 57%. So that's that's a real theme coming through um, and will be something that we're they're exploring in this, in this discussion today. Um, so it leads quite nicely onto the first question that I have for our panelists, which is um, how the pandemic impacted on the rate of technology adoption in the New Zealand legal sector. Um, obviously, it was a bit of a crash course for many of us. So uh, I'm keen to hear your experiences and thoughts. Um, Tom, maybe if we could start with you. Sure. Thanks, Sophie. Look, um, I mean, as you said, it was a crash course, all right. We, we had, I'm part of our um, Future of Work uh, team here at Minters as well and we had this sort of 12 to 18 month plan to get people onto Microsoft Teams and, and to really bring some of the laggard members of our organization through gently and quietly onto these platforms so we could you know, bring them into the, into the 2000s for starters uh, and um, and we basically had to deploy overnight and we were very lucky that we had systems that enabled us to, to move really quickly but we literally dropped Teams onto everybody Pretty much overnight and um but what was amazing with that was that it enabled people very quickly to adopt new ways of working so we had people immediately pick up and adopt kanban processes so they could work with their teams to understand how many how much people had on at any given time so in the morning and in the afternoon people were doing a seven minute stand up and then a seven minute stand up in the afternoon as well just to check what they had on that day and, and <clears throat> how they would got on during the course of the day which was amazing to see not by any prescription just people were picking up and moving as they went along um i mean we had as you can see in the room here we had some zoom type rooms so people knew the technology and the ways that certain technology could be used but it was the way they migrated to using it so innately and this didn't just include the digital natives but but everybody within the firm as well <clears throat> so that was really that was really impressive. Paper light was the other thing that was um, quite impressive to watch as well. With you moving from a multi-screen environment in the office to a single screen, you move from printing in the office to no printing at all. How people adapted to that and how that's carried through as well. So coming back into an office environment, people have stayed off paper. Um, a lot of people using tablets to take notes and storing those Im immediately into document management systems has meant. Um, a real transition incredibly quickly, far quickly, far more quickly than we thought would happen. Um, and it's stayed and it's embedded and hasn't gone back the other way. So it's been really great to watch and enlightening to see. So Lou, I'm really interested, um, particularly what you said there about moving to kind of agile work practices and Kanban and, and, and the way that um, those, I guess, traditionally tech sector um, practices have been quickly, quickly picked up on in other sectors um, during this environment certainly we've, we've, we've found the same thing here and Charlie did you did you find a similar experience in your practice? 
Yeah, um, very similar, actually. I think the biggest um, change for us, so we're, we're a technology media and IP law firm. So for us, we were already in the cloud. Um, we already had remote systems operating. So it was seamless for us to move um, and work remotely. But one thing that we uh, adopted very quickly was collaboration tools. So um, so we were all on um, uh, Teams and used Zoom and things like that. But what we hadn't done is um, collaboration internally with the team. We, had, we didn't have systems in place for that. So for example, Slack or Miro, where you share whiteboards to be able to collaborate. All of those sorts of technologies were what we had to pick up really quickly because it was more the internal comms, you know, the chatting to your teammate who sits outside or um, going down and chatting to, um, you know, a, another partner to talk about what's happening on a matter. It was that communication that we hadn't um, kind of turned our minds to. And so collaboration tools like Slack or Miro were really helpful. But I think for us, one of the... Um, one of the things we had to get our heads around very quickly is with any of those collaboration tools, how secure were they? Are we, you know, what's the security like on it? Have we done, um, have we tested it? Are we comfortable with where it's at in terms of the security um, protocols that are around? Um, so that was really important for us to kind of get our heads around really quickly as well. Mm, absolutely. And, and, and Wayne, I suppose from a, an academic point of view, a huge shift mm -hmm. um, and, and do you think the, the change that, that you've gone through is indicative of um, where we might see uh, legal academia going as well? Um, yes, I think, I mean, uh, academia, uh, well, particularly tertiary education, has been slowly moving on online anyway. Um, but the main way that has been used is to resource delivery. So um, online readings, uh, case books, um, things have, have moved online for some years, but all of a sudden uh, we had to deliver uh, lectures, uh, interact with our students um, through online, which uh, many of our staff hadn't uh, experienced before. Some of them have used Zoom before, but um, never, never particularly as a um, teaching tool. And um, some of our classes, our core, core curriculum classes, have up to 340 um, students. So uh, managing that is, has been a huge, um, huge challenge. And previously, people have said, there's no way you can deliver a um, legal education online. Um, obviously, um, we did, and we, 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 we have, and I think um, we've even delivered, you know, um, uh, moots, um, students doing moots online, client interviewing, student presentations. Um, so all of those things, we, can, we can't now say that they are not possible. Um, I think um, we are unlikely to go back to only face-to-face. -face. Um, I, I would see that legal education going forward will be a blend or hybrid. Um, there will be some face-to-face -face, um, uh, teaching, but uh, I, I can't see us being able to um, step back now. I think the transformation is, um, is permanent now. Mm. And I think that's such an interesting point um, across all sectors uh, is that, as you say, we can no longer argue that this isn't possible. I mean, it, although there's obviously been challenges the last few months has definitely proven to everybody, I think just how uh, well um, virtual collaboration can work um, as well as highlighting obviously those challenges that everybody's touched upon. Um, so interested now to um, go back to a bit um, of feedback from the audience. So we have um, a second poll that is uh, asking about some of the tools or methodologies that you found useful both during and post the lockdown period. So hopefully you're seeing that on your screen now. Um, if there's anything that you found useful that's not listed there, we'd be really interested to hear about that. So um, please pop that in the chat function if, if, if there's anything that you use that isn't listed in that list there. Um, practices as well as tools would be interested to hear about whether other people have adopted some of the things that Tom was speaking about in terms of some of those um, agile methodologies. I see somebody in the chat there's um, mentioned Mural. So we, we use that as well. It's, um, it, that's that's a, another useful collaboration tool along the lines of Miro and Slack. Um, we'll give the poll just maybe another 
30 seconds. Tom, orthodox, of course. <laughs> I'll get a plug in. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, and certainly be interested to hear more about that, actually, when we, um, in our next discussion. Um, most of the info coming through at the moment says virtual collaboration tools um, and communication tools seem to be the, uh, and online research databases, which I guess we should be happy about. It's <laughs> <laughs> good to hear. <laughs> okay. We've got another moment. <laughs> Excellent. I think most people have, I'll just end the polling and share that with everyone. Oh, wow. Yeah, really clear, clear themes coming back there, both with the communication and the collaboration. Um, and I think, you know, that speaks to and Charlie's point about missing those kind of uh, moments where you see somebody in the corridor and you have a quick two minute conversation that can be really useful. Um, uh, I know. I know. Here we have have really um, been searching to find that balance of of the online collaboration and and trying to make sure that we still have those um, spontaneous moments that happen outside of planned meetings. So, so thank you for that. Just, Sorry, just, just touching on that, what was interesting, um, some of our teams did here during the collaboration during the lockdowns was to leave a channel open on Teams. So effectively, open up a. Um, a, a a conversation, uh, an open video conversation, and have people actually work online, but with that open conversation able to happen. So for an hour a day, they were actually just letting the window stay open, and people could chat, you know, as they're working, and hey, just a quick question or, or things like that. So you knew that there was always an hour in the day where you could have that conversation with everybody, uh, and those who couldn't make it for whatever reason didn't have to join. But that was a really nice idea of actually just creating that environment. So even now, when we come back into the office, those who are working from home from time to time often can find that's a good thing for them to do as well. I'll actually open up a channel and people could leave it open and just chat through while they're at the desks. I like that. Might have to steal that one. <laughs> we, we, did a, we did a similar similar thing on a Friday afternoon is that we would have um, a couple of hours where people can just pop in and chat to, the, um, to their colleagues um, just to try and keep that. Um, connection happening and um, those spontaneous conversations as well. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a really important part, isn't it? Um, all right, well, we'll move to our second um, question for the panellists now, which is a bit of a meaty one, um, and one that I'm really interested to hear whether your answer to this question might have changed um, pre-pandemic to, to now. Um, so, keen to understand um, what, your, what, what you think uh, the technology that will most disrupt the legal industry in the next two years, in the next five years, would be. So, um, Wayne, I'm going to throw it to you first for your thoughts. Okay. Um, and, and focusing on legal education, um, I think the, the move that we've done to this kind of hybrid um, online, offline thing is going to change the way that some of our students um, consume uh, legal education. I can see that um, there, there's going to be much more customization of, of degrees and law degrees particularly because um, you no longer will be bound um, by one university. So um, you, you will be able to take a course maybe um, law and AI and robotics here in um, Waikato but um, then take immigration law at Canterbury um, and be able to combine those and you don't even physically have to be there at, at at this, at this time, and we're, we're already seeing this, start, this move start to happen over summer school, so um, that students are now uh, picking and choosing from uh, multiple universities because we're all offering at least a hybrid, um, a hybrid delivery where people can access um, those systems. Um, another, another area I think is going to change um, uh, for legal education is that every law student is really going to need some awareness and understanding of how um, uh, technology impacts on substantive law and um, legal practice. And um, to achieve this, um, you actually need the academics to be aware um, of and, and be able to expose their um, students to that during um, their kind of um, teaching areas. Um, and this will perhaps disrupt some or not even maybe most of what we teach um, and what has been taught in the league and law schools for a long, long time. Um, so the academics actually need to be upskilled. Um, and um, this is what our, our project is actually um, designed for is um, providing those tools and resources 
uh, for all legal academics um, to be able to integrate that technology within their legal education. Um, and um, finally, um, uh, I think for education and probably for legal practice as well, the video conferencing technologies will continue to develop and with an emphasis on sort of um, virtual presence technologies um, to make users feel more connected and to have a much more immersive um, experience. And you know, mm -hmm. this could be anything from virtual reality to uh, much more interactive um, software to um, holograms even. Um, and and um, these, um, this, these, this will try and combat what some people have called loneliness technologies, um, whereas we are that more isolating, um, uh, even though we're more connected, we are uh, more isolated. And I think education is going to have to move into this more virtual space. They're going to need to be more immersive. They're going to need to move beyond that kind of sea of black Zoom screens um, that we currently see from many of mm. us. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And um, um, I, I mean, I think what you say about preparing um, graduates for, for the new reality of legal practice is really interesting. And I'm also interested to hear from you whether you are seeing students um, sort of coming up with their own ideas for innovation in, in the legal world um, during their study. I mean, I know um, we see sort of hackathons happening between legal students and um, IT students um, elsewhere um, and in New Zealand. So uh, interested to hear whether you're seeing some of those innovative ideas come through right from from law school? Um, I, as, I, as was mentioned before, I um, teach in the uh, Masters in Cybersecurity, and that um, Masters is for both uh, computer science students and law students. And in that space, um, it starts off, there are law students sit on one side of the room, uh, computer science on the other. Um, but as we go through that, that, that course, there, there is this cross pollinization um, um, through um, ideas and thoughts, and it is in that course where I'm starting to see some really exciting um, thoughts and ideas uh, merging mm. from um, the connection of both computer science and, and law students. Mm, which will surely just become more merged as, as we go on, I can imagine. Um, and Charlie, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about this. I mean, I, I know obviously in your intro, I mentioned your involvement with the AI forum, but interested to hear. Um, what technologies you think are going to be the most disruptive in the short and mid term? Um, I think, I guess, um, in terms of the technologies, I think uh, you're right, AI will have an impact, and I'm sure D Tom will be able to speak um, to that. Um, and also, I think big data will really have an impact as well on um, how uh, lawyers operate and the work that we do. Do, um, and how that's condensed down. But I think from in the short term, I think um, at least what we're seeing in our practice is actually what's really important or what is going to be key um, is our ability as an external uh, partner or an external law firm to actually plug into our clients' work systems and to actually work in a collaborative way with clients in what are shared environments. So environments where clients and an external law firm can work on documents, on collaboration, on projects in a secure way. And so we um, have a client, for example, who um, requires us to work entirely within their environment, within their technology environment, um, for providing legal services to them. So we retain, retain counsel for um, this particular client. Um, they, they are glo a global organization and all of their legal services, internal and also external providers are required to provide um, uh, their legal advice within the client's environment. So we have dedicated um, systems that we have to use for them. So for example, we use JIRA, um, JIRA being a software development tool originally, but we actually use JIRA to, um, for all legal issues that come up, for all legal matters that they send to us, is comes through as a ticket that we deal with and respond to in JIRA. So I think from our perspective, um, in the short term at least, it's going to be really important to find secure ways of working with, as, as an external law firm, um, it's really important uh, and key for us to be able to find secure ways of plugging in and working with our clients. Yeah, and, and I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, 
that, that you're working in Jira. Obviously, we, we use it here, um, but uh, really interesting to hear kind of wider impact of, of, of those technology tools. Um, and I wonder if that's going to cause challenges if, if, there's, if multiple clients are requiring um, multiple different uh, tools to be used. So um, yeah, it'll be an interesting so one to watch. Yeah, so one of the things we've been kind of um, thinking about is when we are working wholly within a client's environment, how do we, um, you know, uh, how do we comply with our requirements as an external law firm to keep records, to have files that we um, hold uh, confidentially for our clients? If everything is happening in a client environment, how do we take that information and have our own records of it? Um, and that requires, I think, a, a discussion with clients as to, you know, what it is their environment allows, how, how does their technology work, and whether, you know, it's a collaborative process. If you would like us to work in those environments, how do we continue? Continue to comply with our legal obligations and and um, practice management, you know, requirements effectively. Mm, yeah, really interesting point. Um, Tom, keen to, keen to hear about your experiences and thoughts in this area as well. Absolutely. Um, look, I think the the key for me is is that word disrupt. And and again, um, talking about this from a commercial law practice, and I'm a commercial lawyer, so not looking at this from a litigation or any other area. I think. What we are going to see in terms of ongoing disruption is going to be incremental change rather than a big bang approach. Um, what do I mean by that? I think and we've already got a lot of these products in market at the moment. So automation is, is there, but I think it's going to get more involved in what people do. Um, things, a newish one, a newish, but it is starting to see a lot more prominence is the chatbot, but a chatbot that you can build yourself. So the platform is created for you and you build the chatbot so that clients can find their way to information within your organization without having to come to you if there's no real need for them to come to you. Um, apps as well, there's a lot of move into the application world of era where a lot of um, law firms globally now are starting to make apps where people can find information out on their phone, get ready access to it. So a collaboration with their clients through their phone as opposed to the old traditional way of, of emailing, etc. cetera. Um, Echoing what both have said before around collaboration, um, I think co-authoring on documents is something that is starting to make its way into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fascinating one. Rather than constantly emailing each other the document, actually having it in a portal where both can access it at the same time in the same way. Again, to Charlie's point, hyper secure. It's got to be secure, but there's plenty of platforms these days that can that can create that secure um, layer for you to to access. I think that's coming through. And one that's sort of dear to my heart is AI, um, but I don't think by any stretch of the imagination, AI is going to um, replace lawyers. I think it's only going to be at least in the two and five year period, I think, um, an enhancement to legal services rather than a replacement of. Um, uh, without putting too far a plug on it, but I'm gonna plug it anyway. So we, we built our own AI product in combination with a company called Goat Ventures, um, and it's run by McCarthy Finch. Um, which is the joint venture company. And that is an enhanced AI product. So it works with the lawyer on, as a Microsoft Word plugin. So you review a contract using AI in your own um, environment, which is a Microsoft Word environment. And what's really clever about it is that it helps you to review and to draft and to extract information from a document, but it doesn't take the lawyer out of the loop, which I think as we'll come on to the next question, keeps that human element going. Mm -hmm. Um, but AI, I think, will do incremental change. There was a lot of hype about four or five years ago, funnily enough, um, that AI would replace lawyers and that in a two to five year win window, it would replace lawyers. Well, we're five years on and it, we're still here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's got a long way to go before it's actually removing the lawyers from the ecosystem, simply because mm -hmm. there's so much nuance and experience that you bring to it that, are, that an AI is going to take a long time to develop. But um, AI is, is coming. It's, it's certainly working its way through, but it's going to be a, a, an incremental change rather than a wholesale mm -hmm. change. And we're even seeing how that's playing out with a whole market shift happening now where some of the very big players making, you know, getting $100 million investments overseas are starting to vanish or, or you know, join, merge. So I think we are going to see a, a contraction of the market first before it settles down and moves forward. And then the other one I'd throw out there, which I think is an interesting one, because it will quietly now, not, not the big, big noise that it came about three or four years ago, will quietly now embed itself in there, and that is around blockchain and smart contracts. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's there. It is still coming. Um, it's certainly not 
coming with the accelerated push that we had two or three years ago, but it is certainly there. And I think a lot of automated processes will start to, to really come to light soon as there's a lot of people working in that space right now. Um, and we'll start to see more of those automated processes coming through associated with blockchain technologies. And you'll see smart contracts executing contractual um, relationships without the need for lawyers to even be involved other than perhaps to create the wording environment that the programming is then sort of followed on from behind. So that's sort of my thoughts on a two to five year window. I certainly don't think we're, we're gonna see a massive change who knows? But in the two to five year window, I wouldn't thought there's a massive change coming. It'll also be incremental as we go. Mm. Yeah, which, 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 as you say, is, is interesting when you think back to some of those kind of um, disaster narratives that were happening around. Well, disaster if you were a lawyer narrative saying that uh, lawyers were going to be taken over by robots. Um, and as you say, I mean, chatbots have such a useful function for some things, but um, I don't think we're going to see chatbot lawyers for some time yet, I hope. <laughs> That's, that's funny. I think, I mean, there are more being used. There's a lot of, lot of put to very good use during COVID um, where people would say, find information on this. So, you know, a lot of questions coming into law firms, uh, Australian affiliate law firm, um, Montrealis in Australia put out a, a, a COVID chatbot, which was really nice because it would let people find information that they needed to very quickly and easily, which took people off the phones. Because um, mm -hmm. people ring up with a panic question. A lot of the early stages of panic question, what I do with my rent, um, situation, what do I do with my employment situation, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of the triaging of that question could be done via chatbot, which led people to the right part and then and went this sort of question in that way. So I think chatbots for triage mm. are going to be really, really useful uh, and they are getting better. And for those um, interested, have a look at one called Joseph, J-O-S-E-F. Um, that's a, a, a really quite a neat looking um, product that's coming in into the mainstream now with chatbot technology behind it. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I think a theme from um, everything that we've talked about really is the is the uh, is where technology can take away those triage or those admin or those kind of formulaic tasks that leave the 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 legal professional or the academic to do the most valuable work. Um, and I guess that's ultimately where hopefully legal technology is is all aimed at. Um, all right, well, that was a really interesting discussion. So I'm gonna now um, open up for the last of our three polls. Um, so that should be appearing on your screen in a moment. We're keen to understand from you um, what your biggest concern is about the advance of technological changes in the legal industry. Um, and I've just remembered it's actually not one that's going to appear on your screen. It's going appearing in the chat box. So we didn't want to have a multiple choice one for this because we really wanted to just hear your, your, um, your thoughts. Um, so you can see the question now in the chat box. If you can enter um, your thoughts about um, any concerns you have about the advance of technological changes, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So we'll give it a couple of minutes. Uh, we've had one come through. Um, I think it's just come through the panelists, so I'll, I'll read it out without naming names. Um, someone's mentioned security um, with regards to technological changes. And certainly something that, that came up in the discussion um, was the security aspect. I'm seeing some more come through now, Alex. Yeah. So yeah. I can see expense, um, speed of implementation, client acceptance of the use of technology is a really interesting one, particularly um, uh, when we think about what Charlie was saying there, um, how do we train and upskill new lawyers if the junior work is being done by a computer? Um, access to justice is an interesting point. Um, can the public access some of the more expensive AA options? A couple of themes coming through there about accessibility. Um, they're coming in thick and fast now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, We've got some about the kind of rate of change happening at the moment, um, digital divide between um, practitioners, academics, policy, students that opens the gap even further for access to justice, which I think is a really, really interesting point. 
Um, also, some feedback here about government needing to adopt new technologies, courts, loans, etc. Um, obviously, there's a huge review happening at the moment into the way that courts are operating since the pandemic. So that's, I think, a really interesting area. Um, and another concern is team acceptance for the need for change. So yeah, that sort of change management um, aspect, I think, is, is also a really interesting one. I think um, well, we've got some more coming in now again. <laughs> this is really useful feedback, so thank you for your comments. Um, training juniors and leaving the elderly behind. Um, there's a comment here um, about the billable hour and how technology affects that. So that's an interesting point, I think. Um, the risk that te no, technological benefits will be been monopolized by current law firm owners. Um, so again, I think that speaks to the accessibility point um, and needing to ensure that dealing with people face to face and ensuring that access to justice isn't lost. Um, so that, that point about face to face um, leads us nicely into our next point. I encourage you to keep putting um, comments in that chat function and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely come to them because there's some really interesting themes coming through there. But I'll just pick up on that, um, that theme um, around the face-to-face the, the -face nature um, of law and how that's changing. Um, so the, the last question, um, formal question, I guess, before we get to the Q&A that I'd like to pose to the panelists is around that human element. So um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how, on what the impact um, is from technology on the human element of legal practice or legal education. So, and Charlie, if I could start with you, I'm interested to hear your thoughts here. Sure, I guess um, one of the experiences that we had um, when we did all move into lockdown was about how, as I mentioned, how do we collaborate with the team and work with our junior um, team members. And um, the feedback that we were getting is that it was really difficult for senior staff to delegate work and flow down work to junior members of the team. And that was actually adding to their anxiousness over that period. Um, you know, lots of people were losing jobs and, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty around and working remotely on tools that weren't, I guess, um, perfect for collaboration was really difficult for us to monitor how the team was doing, whether they all had enough work, whether the work was getting delegated down, was it being um, supervised in the right way, um, were they getting the support that they needed. Um, and really interestingly, when we all came back to the office and we were like, so who would like to work from home all the time or work remotely all the time, the juniors were like, hell no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> that was really tough for us. We don't want to do that. So I think I think in terms of the human element, um, you know, lots of people commented uh, in response to that last poll about how do we train our junior lawyers? How do we ensure they keep learning? How do they get the supervision that they need? And I think those are all really, really good uh, questions in terms of the adoption of technology. Um, but I also think something Wayne mentioned is also really important to bear in mind. Um, in terms of technology and, and things like, um, uh, you know, automated processes and, um, uh, you know, uh, adopting auto automation to help with creation of documents. I think those are all really helpful, but I also think we need to be aware that at times technology can be isolating. Mm -hmm. um, so it can, it can, where we do start whole scale adoption of technology, I think we do also need to turn our minds to how that will impact our team. We already work in really high stress environments. Um, we already have a pretty terrible record, track record in terms of our mental health. Um, how does how does the adoption of technology actually make that better or worse? And actually, have we, you know, because lockdown was a very instant thing. We all adopted technology really quickly because we had to. There was no real um, due diligence or thought or mm. uh, care taken to ass assess impact. We just kind of adopted it um, and we had to. So that was what we did. But I think going forward, I think more care and thought does need to be given to, A, how do we look after our team, both in terms of their learning and experience, but also in terms of their well-being. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, really interesting points there around kind of the continuing, continuing education aspect of this. Um, 
dive into the deep end that some of us have had. Um, Tom, does that match your, your experiences in, in, in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I completely echo everything you said, Anchele. I mean, it, it is, technology is hugely beneficial to enable us to do more um, from anywhere without using the traditional ways of you know, doing law. Um, but it is something that pushes people apart um, because you sit at your desk, you plug in, you do all your work. You can do that from home. You can do that from down the road. You can do it from anywhere. It is very isolating because everything we need, we have at our fingertips. So all of a sudden you're in a, our firm's 300 people. You have a 300 person firm, but we could be really isolated in the groups we've got, which, you know, echoing exactly what Anjali said, that can push more pressure on you because you haven't got that natural sort of, I'm sitting in the office with the senior or I'm, you know, and working on a document together because we're writing it down, you know, or writing on the, on, on the page then and there. So you have to do more, I think, as a firm like ours, we have to do more to proactively bring people back together again. And we're really fortunate. We've just moved offices and part of the design in our office that we came up with was to have a central stairwell in our old office to go between floors. We had to go out into the fire exits effectively and come back in again. So it wasn't very nice to do that. And it was through multiple secure doors, et cetera. So it wasn't very conducive to those collision conversations and the collaboration conversations around the water cooler. So we made a decision to put in a central um, stairwell in our office and instantly when you're back in the office, you're having those, hey, I just saw you on the stairwell where I'm bumping and saying, hey, just what about that? And those coll those collision conversations are really important. So, But you actually have to design your environment around that. And you have to design also the tools that you use around that. So part of what we did with um, developing McCarthy Finch as well to build in a training component into it was so that, I mean, when, when we're all, well, I'm a little bit, when I was first, starting my my learning experience at Belk Alley back in the day. Um, I One of the first tasks I had was to go to a due diligence up in Albert Street and sit in a dark, dingy room for about three weeks on end, working my way through packs upon packs of documents, reading for the various you know material clauses that I had to pull out and to identify to the client. And that, in combination with the 16 others who were in that room, was kind of, that was a way of learning because we'd go up there together. It was very collaborative. We would look at the clauses and talk about them together. If you're using an AI tool now that does it all for you, don't know why a clause is relevant. So what we did with our tool that we built, and I think it's beholden on every developer to think this through when they're developing tools for practice, is we built in a component that could, ex that could explain why. So when it finds a clause, and pulls it out and says, this is wrong, it explains why. There's like a note underneath to say, this is bad because. And likewise, when you're putting a clause into a contract, it'll tell you when not to use it. So there's a training component that's almost like having a senior lawyer next to you to help explain the why, which does two things. One, it speeds up the process because they're not having to wait for that person to be available. Two, it's using the best of the brains into that tool as well. So you're getting a consistent and right answer every time. So I, so I guess where I'm going with this is technology has the potential to help us dramatically, but it can push us apart. So what you have to do is use that technology in a cleverer way to try and bring that training component in. And also that means when that person then asks the senior the question, hey, have I got this right? You're not sort of, wrong word is to say wasting the time, but you're not extending the time needed to do that training because it's helped you with that first step of training. And then you can have the, the conversation in a much more targeted way. So it's important, I think, to build the environment within which you work, like having that one hour a day if you're working from home, that it's an open channel as well, so you maintain that conversation. Because without it, then we are just literally sitting in a box somewhere with a screen on, and mm. that's not a great place for anyone to be for, for any um, mental health or anything like that. No, absolutely. And I think um, really interesting points there, that the, that the increasingly remote nature of work is actually... Um, caused us to assess the physical environments that we work in when we are in the same place, um, as well as, 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 as those work practices, um, to have those, as, as you called them, the collision moments, um, is, is fascinating. Um, Wayne, I know you spoke earlier about some of the benefits of the, the way that you've had to teach um, this year. Um, do, you, do you see that the um, impact on the human element of teaching is going to be overall a positive one. Um, interesting um, to hear your thoughts. Well, over lockdown, I've got 15-year-old twins, a boy and a girl, 
and over lockdown, um, they both were obviously engaged in online learning. Um, my, the, my son, he um, really took to it, really enjoyed it, uh, got a lot out of it. Uh, my daughter, on the other hand, um, found it a real struggle. And um, that experience for uh, me as a parent, um, trying to help both of them and support them and seeing such a different experience, um, help me reflect on our, on our students as well, that uh, some people really can engage um, and make those connections in a virtual digital space and just some people can't. And that's why I believe that uh, moving forward, it's always gonna have to be a hybrid kind of approach um, and to, to create those actually spaces where you do have some face-to-face -face contact with our, with our students. They're here for four years, um, we need to know them, they can't get lost. So universities are really going to have to uh, work hard in this space to keep their students connected, uh, to create a kind of sense of community because as, as we've already started seeing some of our students, they're feeling kind of disconnected from the university. Um, and um, we're going to have to actually monitor well-being in a much more sophisticated um, way to just um, keep make sure our students are engaging. But I also think it's one space where we, as universities, can um, help an interface between um, education and, and practice. Um, uh, we're actually developing a um, new elective called digital lawyering, um, and um, which is going to develop and strengthen a whole series of skills where um, students kind of need to be exposed to the opportunities of uh, new technologies, new business models, thinking outside the square, um, and, and um, be able to understand how they can actually add value to a tech-rich law firm so, so that they can value their contribution and not feel um, so, so isolated. Um, and one, one way we're looking at that is around design thinking, um, uh, implementing design thinking on to legal problems and um, tech solutions. Um, and um, another emphasis in that course will be on well-being and uh, how do you manage those loneliness, loneliness technologies? Um, how do you manage social media and digital etiquette, um, cyber hygiene, um, things that um, law firms have been saying, students of these new graduates sometimes uh, there's a disconnect between um, I can use the technology, but I can't use the technology in a way that's acceptable within um, there. So um, in that way, we can uh, help that transition from, uh, from the education space to the, um, to the work, work environment. Mm. Yeah, and a really interesting point you make there about design thinking. I know that um, in other jurisdictions, courts have actually been looking at how they can um, implement design thinking and um, I, I guess that also goes to, to some of the themes we've talked about today around tech processes being implemented in in law increasingly. Um, Wayne, I'm interested to hear also how the conversation between practitioners and um, universities continues so that the realities of practice are addressed in study. Um, Obviously, this, obviously, the project you're working on um, looks at that, but how do we do that on an ongoing basis, do you think? Yeah, and I think that's vitally important. Um, there's been a disconnect um, in the past between academia and, and practice, um, and there's been a, been a resistance to, um, to embrace practice um, and, and um, changes in practice. But um, of it, I, th I believe um, going forward that that is um, going to be vital for um, ha delivering a relevant and flexible and um, um, legal education. Um, and as you said, this project has been one of those ways where we're trying to connect with, um, with, the, um, with practice and um, academia and also the tech companies to, to um, create that dialogue. Um, the idea for this project is that we would have some continuing, um, we've created these networks, uh, we've created the platform uh, where we can deliver resources and um, content. Um, we we want to have some ongoing um, um, presence uh, and not just when our funding runs out in July next year, um, that, we'll, that we'll be able to continue. Um, and we're, we're investigating ways to do that. But um, I definitely believe that um, academia needs to talk to practice more and um, practice needs to come and tell us 
um, what they're doing, what they need to do, and what they need from our graduates. Mm. Thank you. Well, some, some really fascinating insights there across the board. Um, and uh, lots that I'd love to delve into further, but um, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. So um, I want to thank all the panellists for their really, really interesting um, thoughts across those questions. Um, we do have time now for Q&A. So um, I will hand over to Alex, because I think she's been keeping an eye on the Q&A questions. So Alex. Um, well, we haven't had any questions, um, and I've just realised I just typed half a question to everybody, invitation to everybody, in the chat function. I was going to say, if you've got any questions you want to direct to the panellists, um, or to Sophie, but uh, make most panellists while we've got them here, um, uh, please uh, put them in the chat function, um, and uh, we can uh, share them around. Um, alternatively, um, we can... We actually, I was going to say we could possibly circulate them afterwards, but it's probably better if we do it here and now. Um, but it's looking like we haven't got any that have come through. I might um, jump in with a question yeah, that I have please then. Do. <laughs> um, and, and we'll see if we can't have anything yeah. come, out, uh, come through while I'm talking. But um, just when we were discuss, discussing Ben, Wayne, that kind of conversation between... Um, uh, practitioners and, and academia, I was wondering how we foster um, ongoing innovation within, um, within practice as well as, 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 as in the student um, sphere. So Tom and Anchali, I'm interested to hear from you um, either about current practices that you have within your firms to kind of foster innovation uh, in, in the way that lawyers work um, or how we do that more on an ongoing basis. So I guess for, um, we have um, an innovation working group within the firm. Um, so that looks like at both innovation internally for our internal processes, business processes, but also externally and how we work with clients. So that, that allows us to, I guess, you know, we, we if you run a business, you're very busy running a business and you spend very little time thinking about um, or you, you're very busy doing the work and you spend very little time about actually are we doing this in the best possible way? Are we using the right technology? Are we using the right business processes? And so that working group is very much um, to kind of put our heads above the parapet, have a look around um, and see actually what are our internal needs? What are our client needs? And are we using processes and technologies in the right way to address those. So I think that's been really helpful and I would I would highly recommend that others, you know, look into doing that. Um, just because it gives you takes time out of the day where people can just sit around and think about these things. Whereas mm -hmm. usually in a day, you know, it's very busy, you're getting the work done and um and it's hard to think about how do we innovate, how do we stay um, relevant to both 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 at the team that works here, but also to our um, clients. I think so. That's been really helpful. Um, but also, I think our clients are driving us more and more to be innovative. I guess we are very privileged in terms of the technology clients that we have, and they are leaders in the fields that they work in and so they are also driving us to look at um, you know how, how do we work with them what are the tools that we use what sort of security do we have in place um, you know why how, how, how easy do we make it for them to do business with us and so that was also leading us to uh, you know think outside of the square um, look at different options um, and also just adopt um, practices that, you know, we might not otherwise have thought of, like like the JIRA example, for example. Yeah, really interesting. And Tom, in, anything that you'd add to that? Yeah, um, so we also have a, an innovation team, which I, I am lucky enough to head up. Um, and we, looking, we look all the time at the way we do our work. Can we be more efficient at it? Can we automate any processes? Can we you know, remove any blockers that have too many sort of hands on the way through to, to preparing things. And that's an ongoing thing with dedicated team that actually do, does the operational side of that. And, and what's spawned out of that is, is a couple of products as well that we've ended up selling to clients. So 
that's a, a neat way for those who are thinking about it. There's actually a, there's a financial benefit in terms for you internally. You become more efficient, which is a good thing. A good th thing for clients too. And then externally, if you can sell it to clients and you're creating a new revenue stream, which in this day and age is, a, is also a good thing. So, um, so things like a, we've got a document uh, management system. We've got a um, an obligations register for people who are you know, running risk registers. We, we've got one of those as well. Um, AI came out of um, a conversation internally or on, a, on a delegation to Israel actually came out of, but it came out of conversations that happened internally that people then submitted to the board to say, we want to do this. And the board makes a decision on whether to do it or not. So a lot of those decisions have fallen by the wayside and on the editing room floor, but a lot have also gone through but one thing I would say to those who are thinking about having an innovation cycle within their organization is if you go to your teams and say, we're going to do an innovation workshop or a hackathon or something or rather, a really cool thing to do, but you've got to be prepared to follow through because there's nothing worse than those who are putting their heart and soul into creating an idea than to see that sort of go, thanks, I'm not going to deal with that one. You know, so I think if you're going to have a culture of innovation, um, you've really got to think through how am I prepared to sort of stump up the cash to then take those innovations through? Um, because otherwise you can, you can get a real negative result from it. So um, I think it's quite a, quite a key point there. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you both for that. All right. Well, um, we do have a few questions come through now. I think we're probably um, with the remaining time, probably only just got time to get to one, but certainly we'll circulate the others afterwards. Um, um, Sophie, so, sorry, sorry, can I just jump in one here? You, you might not be able to see it. It's come through on the Q&A. Um, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's any thoughts to the panellists on how automation might work for legal areas where you don't see repetition of similar documents, i.e. where you might do only two or three of the same type of document in a year? How might automation help you in the future as technology develops? <laughs> over to the floor. <laughs> yeah, it, I'll jump in for my two cents. Um, it's tricky because the whole there's a cost to automation, quite a significant cost to automation. Um, so you see the most benefit from it when you've got something that you're, is highly repeatable and um, and you, you, you're invest, prepared to invest in the front end of that one in order to, to get the efficiencies going at the back. Um, look, I'm sure technology will, will catch up soon um, to enable a faster ability to automate, but unless you've got um, yeah, it's a tricky one, I think, to, to really get a benefit out of that one at the moment where technology is, but who knows, in the next two to five years, something might come up that, that can help with that. Thank you. Um, sorry, Alex, do you have any other ones? Um, there's, there's other ones that have come through on, on the chat function. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can see them. Um, Sophie, are you happy to read off those or? Sure, I think yet? I'll just go to the first one and then, um, and it might be all we've got time for, but um, this one asks about um, whether our panellists think that the Law Society, the New Zealand Law Society, has a role to play in future developments, um, for example, in its own practices engaging with lawyers for training um, and any suggestions as to what or how that, that might look like. Yeah, I think you know, um, as a legal industry, I think we all need to turn our minds to it. And the Law Society is our, um, is our industry body. So I think absolutely um, they play a key role in um, not just um, adopting technologies for their own purposes, but also, I guess, bringing practitioners along on the journey of how technology could assist in legal practice and what may be the pros and cons of adopting that technology. Um, I think that would be a you know, that would be an ideal role for the Law Society to play. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Any, any other thoughts on that one before we wrap up? No, I agree. I think that's a, that's a well said point. Mm, yeah, absolutely. All right. Oh, well, um, we are nearing the end of our time. So um, I'd just like to, again, thank all our panellists um, so much for their time and for their insights. Um, I found it a really um, fascinating discussion, so I hope everybody else has too. Um, and finally, before we before we um, finish off, I just wanted to um, invite anybody who hasn't already to join up to the Lexus Nexus Innovation Panel. Um, so this is a panel of uh, customers who um, are interested in innovation, and signing up to the panel requires no commitment from you other than to be invited to innovation activities happening that may interest you. Um, so if that sounds like something you are keen to be involved in, there's a link in the chat box now. 
um, that uh, will take you through to the sign up page and we welcome as many people um, as we can get to join that to join us in the conversation about the future of law. All right, well, um, again, thank you so much all for joining us and um, a particular thanks to our panel members for sharing their time and their insights. Um, so, Matewa, everyone, um, goodbye for now and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.